So welcome everyone that's joining. We'll give everyone a moment to um, enter the webinar before we get started. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining the Patientory Association's quarterly webinar series. Um, today's webinar, we will be highlighting companies in the healthcare and metaverse space. I'm Chris McFarland, president of the board of the association. Um, the Patientory Association was incorporated as a global nonprofit healthcare member organization in order to meet the needs and facilitation of adoption of emerging technologies in the healthcare industry in order to foster interoperability of seamless healthcare data access and transfer. Since 2018, we fostered educational content and events, most commonly our Block Health Summit in partnership with Smart Dubai, as well as webinars and blogs supported by a global ambassador network championing new innovations to address interoperability use cases. Currently, the association connects healthcare industry adopters of the P2A Matrix blockchain network, which securely stores and manages health information in real time via decentralized nodes, and such storage is managed by the healthcare cryptocurrency P2A. Mm -hmm. Our membership network is currently open to those organizations looking to host or transact their data across the network securely and seamlessly with potential consumers of healthcare information. The goal of today's webinar will be to assess and explore how new technologies such as the metaverse are impacting and changing healthcare's role in providing medical services to the population. As we know, the term metaverse is used to describe a combination of VR, mixed reality worlds, um, access through a browser. Um, right now, what will become the metaverse is actually a series of disconnected metaverses like the wall gardens of the early internet. In internet. It's been 27 years since the commercialization of the internet. Five billion people have an online presence today with the first two phases of the web, web 1.0 and web 2.0. Today, we're on the threshold of web three and the metaverse, the internet environment where transactions are logged on a blockchain empowered by AI. By 2026, it expected that web three technologies such as digital twins, smart spaces, virtual and augmented reality, will transform how people interact with the world. And by then, 30% of organizations in the world would have products and services ready for the, meta for the metaverse, which is expected to hit 679 billion by 2030. Today, we have two speakers that have healthcare metaverses companies already you know, in the market or building in the market. Um, we won't have shift today, but we do have Arabian, who is also an investor in the company. Um, so we can get to learn more and hear why he has invested in, in what they're working on. Now we'll have our speakers introduce themselves. Uh, Michael Kadash, who is a veteran in the blockchain and crypto space and now has ventured deep into the metaverse um, and Arabian Prince, you know, famous rapper, part of NWA group that has taken the charge and in both invest in and lead in healthcare metaverse companies. Um, we'll start with Michael. Yeah, Krista, thank you very much. Thanks for having me here and thanks for the introduction. So I'm Michael, I'm CEO and founder of iMedis and I'm a doctor, been uh, working in hospital for a very long time, also in the pharmaceutical space. And together with my partner, Ben, who's the CEO and co-founder, uh, we started iMedis back in 2017. And the original idea was to start an e-health ecosystem that consists of the typical e-health apps like video chat with doctor's records, um, the, the device tracker devices and, and things like prescriptions, et cetera, and then came to the conclusion that there must be more. The next step was then building an NFT marketplace for medical data because also the field of processing and mainstreaming medical data is a big topic. And our latest catch was then to, to start Amedis Avalon, the first healthcare metaverse, um, which brings all together patients, doctors, hospitals, pharma companies, et cetera. And uh, yeah, so that's why we're here and we, we'd love to talk about it. Oh, you ready for me? Okay. Yeah, I'm Arabian Prince, one of the founding members of the rap group NWA, but that's irrelevant here because um, I'm also uh, a technologist, a futurist. I've been in the tech space for about 41 years doing everything from visual effects to video games to hardware technologies to prototyping and um, I am now the CEO of a company called MD Dow 
at MDverse um, and MyMedV, all in the healthcare space, metaverse style. And basically, me and my partners who are doctors and futurists and investors decided that we needed to do something to not replace healthcare, but be a partner and a conduit to help healthcare change and grow in the future and kind of be more in line with what technology is doing. Like our next generation of youth are handheld phoners. That's what I call them. They have a phone attached to their hand 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So we need to start building systems and technology that kind of meet that. And healthcare is one of the ones that I think is very important to give access to everybody. And, you know, not saying that everybody has a phone, but most, most everybody has a phone. So if we can get to where we have a more interactive web and a more interactive healthcare system, I think, you know, everyone will have a better access to healthcare. So that's kind of what we're building. Thank you, Arabian. Um, and we just had a question. Yes, this recording will be available um, after. We'll send it out once. If you're registered, you will receive a live recording um, of the webinar. Um, so we'll, and please, we do encourage you guys to, um, you know, place your questions um, in the chat section. We will get to them at the end um, for Q&A. Um, so we'll start it out. Um, Arabian and Michael, you know, how do you define the, the metaverse? You want to take that, Michael, first? Yeah, okay, thank you. So um, the metaverse is, okay, we just had an interesting discussion just before the call. So a lot of people associate the metaverse with virtual reality and only with virtual reality and think that the metaverse is only something that you can experience using these big glasses, which is absolutely not the case. So we define the metaverse as an additional dimension, as a service layer that, that comes on top of reality and offers all stakeholders in healthcare that includes the patient, that includes, of course, the healthcare providers to offer, to, to work together and to offer services or to get services in an environment, in a virtual 3D environment, when the real doctor, a real hospital or a real healthcare space is not required or not available. So there are a lot of things in, in, in healthcare, and I know it from my career in hospital, where people come to a hospital or visit the doctor because there is no other option. Um, and that could be solved with a, with a good internet page or a metaverse representation. And so we see the metaverse as an additional service layer that, that catches these opportunities and that gives people an additional space to become healthy or to offer services for others to become healthy. So, and it's of course, virtual reality is a, a major part of that, but I can speak for our metaverse people are able to use it on a smartphone, on a PlayStation, on a computer. For some parts, it po it's possible and it's recommended to use virtual reality glasses, but it's not mandatory and people can use it even without VR. So yeah, that's, that's so basically how I would define it. Yeah, I love that. And, and to um, piggyback on what he said, it's to give access, you know, it's to give greater access because right now the whole world is feeling the pain of not enough people working in all industries. I mean, every industry, like stores to shops to the airports are pretty much shut down because they don't have enough staff. The hospitals, you know, are shutting down because they don't have enough staff. The nurses are quitting. The doctors are quitting. It's getting crazy. So if we can do something to actually relieve some of that pressure, relieve some of that tension, like he mentioned earlier, building something that allows people to do probably 50, 60, 70, maybe even 80% of the things that they would have to go to a hospital to do, do it from their own home or from their phone or from their tablet and only go to the hospital when they really, really need to see a doctor or really, really need to get you know some type of exam. Because if you think back to the last time you went to a hospital, how long did you actually sit with a doctor? Doctors come in, they're in and out in maybe five minutes with you. The rest of the time you're sitting there, you're talking with a nurse, you're getting some kind of test done. Because of COVID, there are labs everywhere now, testing centers everywhere now. So a lot of the things that you would have to go to the hospital to do, 
you could do down the street from your house if you needed to. You could actually physically go to a lab down the street, get blood work, get testing, get all your vitals done. Matter of fact, with connected devices, some of the companies that we're partnering with, you could actually have most of your data and most of your vitals sent to the hospital without even going. So, you know, that's what the metaverse is all about, being this interactive companion to healthcare to help people be healthier and preventative. That's the biggest part is preventative healthcare. If you have a daily interactive companion in your house, like I just bought the, uh, I'm a Google guy. Some people are, you know, Alexa guys or whatever. I'm a Google guy. I got Google. I'm surprised it's not talking to me by saying that, but I got speakers everywhere and all of these things. And, you know, I bought the Google Nest Hub, the little screen. And the little screen does everything. And when I set it up, it was like, hey, we have like a sleep thingy now. Like, and I'm calling it a sleep thingy because I don't know what the technical term for it is. But we got a sleep thingy and we can track your sleep and give you data on how well you sleep. If you wake up, if you're snoring, if you're breathing heavy, if you're coughing. So, you know, in the future, we're going to be connected 24-7 to health. We got it on our watches. We got it on, you know, our phones and things like that. So I think that's where um, the metaverse is going. Yeah, yeah. And Michael and, and Rabin, you guys mentioned a lot of, you know, current ja challenges that we're experiencing today. You know, what what was that spark or, you know, what led you to be an early adopter um, of the metaverse? See, and I think you guys are pretty much like one of the first, you know, two people to really venture in um, with healthcare use cases. Yeah, so um, we started it because it was just the next logical step somehow. Because you know, technology has reached a stage where people are in 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 control of, of devices that can show this. You know, every iPhone, every normal computer has the technical abilities to show high quality 3D graphics. And it's at hand, there's no big hurdle of that. You know, internet speed gets better and better every day, at least in a lot of parts of the world. I know there are a lot of places where it's not yet the case, but it's coming up. And the time has come for that because the, the problem, let's talk about this, the classic e-health market. And you know, we, Chris, uh, Rebbe, and you all are in this business. You know how hard it is to establish a normal e-health application, right? The acceptance for people is not as high as maybe we hoped in the past. And um, the, the situation showed that people need more, more immersion to this, right? Just a second. Ambulance passing by. So the, the people need more in, inclusion in, in, in the experience. So with the metaverse, you get a third dimension. Okay. And people, especially during COVID, noted how important that 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 communication in real life is and the third dimension is because we had we had a lot of Zoom calls during that time, right? And it's just not the same. It's not the same as to communicate with a person in a real 3D environment, and that's what the metaverse can give. So we, it, it's just the next logical step. Yeah, most definitely. And I want to chime in real quick. I'm, I'm kind of like monitoring the chat at the same time. And this question is kind of relevant. Uh, I think it's Manu. I hope I'm saying it right. How was the quality of participants who provide services in the metaverse secured? Is there any special process you have to go through? And what happens if someone is misusing the metaverse? So basically, don't look at the metaverse as something different. It's literally a digital twin of the real world. So onboarding healthcare professionals, onboarding um, health and wellness professionals, it's gonna follow a lot of the same rules and laws that apply in current healthcare. So, you know, if somebody's just like a malpractice doctor, somebody's doing something wrong and it, it's gonna apply to the same laws. There's gonna be some things that are a little bit different and we're gonna, we're looking at how we onboard healthcare professionals, looking at documentations, making sure they're certified or, you know, have their credentials and things like that. But, you know, it, it's almost kind of like a self-policing state. The people will decide who is doing their job and who's not, just kind of like Yelp or any other thing. People will give rates and reviews to the doctors and the people who are doing good things and the ones that aren't, they'll get bad reviews. And the people that are trying to misuse the healthcare system in the metaverse will get smacked around. And, you know, especially because, 
you know, it's going to be a paid service when you're dealing with professional healthcare, just like a doctor has to pay rent at his office. Same thing in the metaverse. I don't think people are going to be messing around too much money if they're paying money to offer a service. So, yeah. Yeah. So I don't have to add much. So I, we do it in a way. So we have our IMATIS platform and that platform is strictly dividing users between patients and professional users. Each professional user that joins IMATIS is manually accredited. So we check, is the doctor a real doctor? Is the nurse a real nurse? And exactly these rules apply to Avalon. So all people that state to be doctors inside Avalon are actually real doctors, where it has been manually checked that they have a legit, so that, that they're legit doctors, right? So it's impossible that we have uh, imposters that say, oh, I'm a doctor and they're not. So there's strict quality control. And that's what you gotta do right from the beginning. Because if you would have the situation where a false doctor would treat a patient and would make a mistake, which of course would, would occur, that would be the mm -hmm. end of it, right? So we have to make sure, as Arabian said, it's the same like in the real world. You just have to copy the rules from the real world to the metaverse, right? Yeah, so Raven, you mentioned that, you know, the metaverse is not entirely different from the real world and how we, we operate today. Um, but can you go into, you know, where, you know, it can be created new economic dynamics, you know, new types of healthcare business model, models and, and how this essentially can help to enforce a, you know, a new patient centric mindset? Yeah, um, our vision is community. And that's, I think, the most important part about this is, you know, right now, hospitals and healthcare is pretty segmented. They're all in their own little boxes, right? You know, if you're, um, I'm not sure how it is in Europe, but in the U.S., Same. you've got some type of healthcare, you know, so you're either with Cigna, you're with Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Kaiser, and you can only go to certain hospitals or deal with certain doctors or, you know, things like that. And Part of that it will be true in the metaverse, but imagine if you take professional healthcare, if you take alternative medicine, and every time I use the word alternative medicine, I get smacked by some doctors and say, don't say that word. I'm like, what happened? They get real scared when you start talking about alternative medicine, right? But I think it's important to put everything in one little bubble, everything in the community and let people interact. That's how you change healthcare, right? So our vision is to put all of these things in the bubble along with patients and regular everyday people to kind of decide what the future of healthcare is, right? So for us, it's, it's really opening the doors and opening the minds of everyone from the doctors down to the patient and letting everybody play on an equal playing field. So I think for us, that's the most important thing. That's good. Michael, do you have anything to add? No, basically not. All set. Okay. okay, good. Guess we can move on to the next question. Um, so you guys are both working in your, you know, particular use cases um, in the metaverse. Like where, where can we start? We have a, a question from, from Talisha um, Shine and she asked like, what are your thoughts to the approach for transitioning from current, you know, web two applications um, to web three? So basically, <laughs> I mean, there's, it, it, it doesn't need much, right? Because Web3 automatically mutates into Web3, Web2 into Web3, right? Because the things that you do in Web2, you can also do in Web3. So we offer this video chat stuff, the medical records and all these things also in the metaverse. So we take all the Web2 applications that we have and put them into the Web3 application. It just gives you more immersion and it gives you more, more more the feeling of participating in that right so it's not mm, it's not it's it's automatically transitioning basically i would say from web 2 to web 3 just like it did in the past from web 1 to web 2 so it was just a floating process right it's not like okay we finish this now and now we go to web 3 it's not like that you you people who are in web 2 they will come into web 3 partially use things they used in web two and then switch to web three. So I think we will make it quite comfortable and it will be quite easy to transition from one to the other. Yeah, yeah, and I, I agree with that totally. And I'll add something to it. I'm, I'm putting like three questions together along with uh, Talisha's is that, you know, web three is gonna be more 
a more secure web because it's predominantly going to be on the blockchain, right? So it's going to be a little more secure. And when it comes to security, that's our first and foremost thing. You know, you got to be in the U.S., you got to be HIPAA compliant. And one thing we decided to do was to be HIPAA compliant is to not really mess with a lot of data, private data, right? Because if you really think about it, private data is already handled by the hospital system, the healthcare system. They already have that information from their patients. So why do we want to play with that stuff? Like we just want to be a conduit, a pass through. So we want to actually connect to healthcare, right? So you can do that without actually touching a lot of very, you know, um, sensitive patient information, right? And because we're on the blockchain, we could actually secure information when we decide to really start getting into that side and really going down to giving patients their information back. That's one of the things that we really, really want to champion is taking patients' information that everybody else had has except but the patient, giving it back to the patients and letting them manage what they give to healthcare systems. Because right now it's just, they got everything, but maybe they don't need to see everything about you. Maybe they only need to see this. So we want to actually change that narrative in the future. But until then, we really want to be secure and not touch too much data. The data that we want, and I'll be clear about this, we want to create a system to where we reward patients with tokens and, and kickbacks and things like that, incentives to opt in to give us some of their information on how they eat, how they sleep, how they exercise. And if they are doing these things to be more preventative in healthcare, they can actually get rewards and incentives to do better. And now you're getting into that preventative medicine state. That's awesome. That's awesome. So we'll take it, you know, now we see, you know, separate um, metaverses, you know, you know, popping up. And, you know, if we look at, you know, the, the gaming industry and, and, and where we really see most of the metaverse adoption, you know, each has its own access, avatars, interactions, currencies, you know, to, to, to look at it from like a Fortnite is, you know, is, is separate from, from Roblox, which is separate from Decentraland and others. Um, how do you see this playing, you know, out as a challenge for healthcare and, and overall adoption, especially if, if healthcare is already, you know, pretty much siloed today? Yeah. So the thing is that, of course, there are a lot of metaverses, great things like Decentraland or Sandbox or Roblox. And the, 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 but the idea of Web3, and that is what Arabian said, is the community, right? So it's not about building silos again, but to build standards to connect these metaverses. But each metaverse has its own um, focus, let's say it like that. Healthcare needs a very special focus. Because I just saw the question about the data security, which is essential for healthcare. So we focus very much on having HIPAA compliance, GDPR compliant, supporting standards like fire and storing the data in a safe space for specialized medical data. But still we want the possibility for people to come from other metaverses to ours. And our people should go to other metaverses because that's the idea of Web3. And as you correctly said, the data silos are one of the biggest problems in healthcare, but not only in healthcare, it's everywhere in the world. And Web3 will break up these silos and will connect and will generate this interoperability. I think that's the idea and what it's all about. So uh, I don't see it as a problem. I see it as a competition. And I think to make anywhere the metaverse successful, not only in healthcare, but in every area, it must be interoperable. And we must work together as companies, even the community and the people to, to make this a success. Yeah. And I agree. I don't even have anything to add to that. He did such a great job. Good job. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, we can get to a, a next question. So, you know, we're, we're pretty much at, at early stages, right? And, and, you know, reports say, you know, we won't really become fully realized until the metaverse connects to technologies and trends like IoT, you know, AR, AI, spatial technologies um, into an immersive digital environment. Um, ideally, you know, much of the tech industry is calling for um, that for platforms to be decentralized and interoperable, like, like you mentioned, um, Arabia and Michael, as opposed to, you know, the walled gardens and, and the silo that we've seen in Web 1 and, and Web 2 infrastructures and in social media, um, you know, that we see today. So what, what challenges, 
can you say we'd have to overcome or the industry currently face, you know, as we gear up for that adoption? You know, one thing, if I may answer to that, Arabia, maybe you have also already an idea about it. The thing is that when we talk about healthcare, we have some very distinctive problems. The idea of decentralizing everything is a great one, but in healthcare, there are certain barriers you cannot overcome. Let's speak about responsibilities for a mistaken treatment, for example. There must be someone who is responsible. You must have someone who is in, in um, responsibility for the things that happen. So certain things, and we speak also about governments and the regulators. When it comes to healthcare, you have all the regulators, you have healthcare uh, rules, and you have governments. And of course, that will never completely uh, disappear, right? I think we are we are we agree upon that. So you have to find the right um, balance between decentralization and a still centralized part. Because in the end, when you get a treatment and it goes wrong. You want to go to someone and say, "Hey, that doctor made a mistake. I want to be, I want to, I want to, I want to be reimbursed for that, or I want to take someone to court." I mean, these are realities that will not disappear in the metaverse. Thus, you will have this is a conflict at, at, at up to a certain point that, of course, can be overcome, but has to be regarded. Yeah, and and what we got to realize too and remember is that this is just an extension of the real world, right? So whatever doctors are doing, especially when you get to get treated by a doctor that you've met in the metaverse or, or interacting in the metaverse, it's still the real world, right? That you're dealing with when you actually interact with that doctor. So they'll, that will fall under whatever laws and governance that he has to abide by being a healthcare professional. As far as the interactivity and interoperability between metaverses, you got to look at the real world. It's the same way in the real world. Once you walk into a hospital, you're in that healthcare system, in that hospital. You're getting treated by that doctor, those, those you know, from hospital professionals in that system. And they may have to send you somewhere else. Or what, like you said, what if they didn't do what you needed to do? You want a second opinion. So you go to another hospital and you meet another doctor. The same things will apply in the metaverse. And we don't need to create ultimate standards um, for cross compatibility, like Sandbox, Decentraland, Avalon, MDDAO, we can all work together. It's just bridges, you're just connecting bridges and you just have to figure out how this patient or this you know avatar moves between systems, right? And that is something that has to be worked out. But if you look at the real world, it's the same way. You know, We're not interconnected all the way you actually have to go somewhere else and deal with something else. So I don't think we'll ever get to this one world of one metaverse and everything just flows around in it because the real world doesn't really work that way either. Exactly. Oh, that's good. That's good. Uh, and Rabian, so you guys, you currently have MD Dow, you, you have a, a host of, of companies, you know, in the metaverse. Can you talk more about like your strategy to identifying companies, you know, you've invested in, in Shift already and, you know, what they're working on and what interested you in, in their strategy and, and, and their use case. Yeah, so the vision that we have is, is like I mentioned earlier, we just wanna be a portal. We wanna be a connective tissue for healthcare and we wanna champion and invest and onboard I mean, I always use um, the old Cat William. Uh, he has like a little joke that he, he says. Cat William says, everything, everything. We want to invest in everything. So we want everything to plug into our metaverse. There's, you know, Avalon. Like I just met him today and I looked at his thing. It looks amazing. So I would love to figure out how do we plug that in? How do we take all the other healthcare startups out there and give them access to the metaverse and plug them in, you know, just be API driven where everybody plugs in with what they do. And what that does is it gives the patient, it gives the person an option of what they want. And that's what the real world is. The real world is people have options. You know, um, when you deal with like the decentralized, I'm not bad mouthing anybody, the decentralized and the sandboxes, there are not that many options right now, right? And if you build a closed healthcare system, what only one or two options, then you're not doing justice. So you want to open it up 
to all types of healthcare startups, all types of healthcare systems, all types of everything. And that's what we want to be. We want to be that just plug that everybody plugs into and offer services. Yeah, that's a good transition as well, Michael. Like, how do you see Avalon or, you know, you know, your healthcare metaverse currently integrated with current, you know, Web2 healthcare companies or future, you know, Web3 yeah. healthcare companies? So I, I can only agree, Raven, because, you know, also we, we thought about that to offer a space not only again to build another silo, but to open it up for everyone involved. So we not only onboard big pharma companies, university hospitals, etc. We also have dedicated spaces for healthcare startups. And we have partnered already with healthcare startups. A great one, for example, is DNAverse, right? We, we partner with the companies and they join Avalon to offer their services and to contribute what they do. This is the unique opportunity because inside this, this space, people will meet and they will start making business. They will start exchanging ideas and they will start building on visions together. Because no matter how good you think you are, and no matter how many ideas you have, there will always be someone who's more, who's cleverer than you and has even better ideas. And we want to have these people. We want to have these people support the idea and build this up, right? And that's why we share spaces for other healthcare startups and health tech companies. And everyone is invited to join and build this with us. <clears throat> Yeah, and this is a good segue. So you said like anyone is invited to join. We have Manu who, you know, asked an earlier question, you know, you know, safeguard against the quality of participants who provides those services in the metaverse, you know, are they secured? Or is there any other process? Like, is there a standards board where you guys are currently going to, to help formulate this? Is it going to be, you know, different rules for, for different metaverses? Like, how do you guys see this playing out? Um, so there, there are, of course, there are not yet real standards. So we just joined the Metaverse Standards Forum that was set up by companies like Meta and NVIDIA and Adobe, etc. So we want to build these standards also when it comes to medical treatments and to processes. And of course, we want to do excellent quality management when we onboard partners. We say, okay, guys, this, these are the rules or the this is the, the, the area in that you are able to move. But we want to give people... We don't want to drown them in rules. So we want to hear what people do and then think together, does it make sense? And is it something that you can accept from an ethical point of view, from a, from a, a business point of view and from a human point of view? But I don't think that this is too, that this is too difficult because it just needs, as Arabian said, the real world rules that apply to healthcare. And you need people that sit together and think about these things. And then you will find good standards for that. Yeah. And, and I'm a firm believer of a strong hand in everything, you know, because I grew up in the hood. So, you know, I always say, like, when I was young and I did something bad, I got smacked. Right. And I think the same thing has to apply in the metaverse. We can't be so lenient and say that, oh, because it's virtual, because it's an interactive thing, because it looks like this, people can do what they want to do because i heard you know stories about in meta's metaverse people are running around like trying to gang rape people they can't because it's virtual but they're doing crazy stuff in there and i'm like they should be punished just as you would in the real world and that will deter a lot of that stuff you know like hey you go and you try to assault or molest somebody in the metaverse it can hold the same type of penalties if you did it in the real world so that will nip that in the bud really, really quickly. So I think that we have to adopt a lot of those rules and laws because there are bullies. There are, you know, uh, people out there that want to troll and hack and do all these things. So I think you have to make those rules like even stronger. Yeah. yeah. So we, 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 we approach this with, with certain admins that are available 24 seven and safe spaces where people can go. So what you said, bullying is something very, um, of course very bad that we address and we don't want that absolutely so people who do that are being kicked out and we create all these safe spaces so people that take care of their health must have a safe space right that is the most important thing a safe space mm -hmm. and that's what we want to offer so of course these rules have to apply yeah oh you know, and the last thing i'll say is this you know don't think that just because you're in a metaverse just because you're in this you know interactive world that you have to interact 
You know what I mean? Because you can, you know, my my belief is if you want to just interact in a world and not talk to, I, you know, there's people out there that don't talk to people. Like I'm, I'm a somewhat recluse when I'm behind closed doors, right? So it's kind of like, if you don't want to interact mm-hmm. with anybody, there are mechanisms that you can put in place where you don't have to. You can just be you in your healthcare and you do that and you never have to see anybody. If you want to walk into a store, I always say like, I would love to walk into Target or Best Buy and it just be me in the whole yeah. store, right? In the future, you'll be able to do that. Like if you want to walk around and mingle with people, that's fine. But what if you could hit a switch, click, and it's just you and shopping and all of that. So I, I think it's going to be a little more both. You can be able to create the world that you really want to live in. Oh, makes sense. Makes sense. I guess looking at it from a, a clinical lens, from a clinical perspective, I know Manu asked, um, do you see the metaverse also as an alternative for, for people who go to the ER, right? Um, there are statistics that, that says 80 to 85% of people in the ER are not, you know, don't re- need, you know, emergency care. And that may be something as we saw, like in telemedicine, you can, can, can be brought out there. Do you see the metaverse as a vehicle, as an option um, to this case? And, and how are we going to, you know, be able to triage that? Yeah, I think Manu refers to a, to a study that was done by the German Barmer Versicherung insurance company in Germany, they did this examination, said that up to 80, 85% of the people coming to an ER are actually no ER patients, but just have simple questions. So of course, that is something where the metaverse and also Web2 already does help, but we still have to strictly distinguish because when I, as a doctor, someone calls me and tells me, hey, Mike, I do have abdominal pain since a few hours and it's so it's hurting so bad. The first thing I will tell this guy is, Go to an ER, do it to an ER. You got to get a lab result. You got to get ultrasound, maybe an x-ray. A doctor has to touch your stomach. So there are certain cases where you absolutely have to go to a doctor. And there, this is also a point where, where uh, virtual platforms can help because there are a lot of people that even don't go to a hospital if they have a heart attack, right? They say, oh, it was just a little pain in my chest and I didn't go. So these things can help, but you have to clearly people have to understand that the metaverse is not replacing a real doctor or a, or a surgery or, an, or a, a real examination in terms of a direct patient examination. It just covers just covers these 80 to 85 percent, which is a lot, of course, but people must not have the illusion that the metaverse can solve everything because that's not the point. No, and, and exactly what he said, exactly what he said, and here's the other thing, my uncle, and okay. you don't know who my uncle is, so I could talk about him. <laughs> I could talk yeah. about his health issues, but uh, he has diabetes, right? And he was complaining. He's like, you know, I've got this pain and I'm feeling kind of weird. And I made an appointment to see my doctor and it's going to take two weeks, two weeks. So he says, the only option I have is to go to emergency, right? Because I have no other option right now. It's like, I gotta either wait two weeks, but what if it's something that's this that could be serious. I need to go sooner. So he goes to emergency, sits there, gets seen, and there you go. So it's something that if people had another option and the problem with, and I'm not saying a problem because telehealth has helped, but part of the problem with telehealth is you still have to wait for a doctor, whether in telehealth or in a hospital right there's just because it's virtual this way on the phone you still are not getting to the doctor you need in the time that you need so um eventually what we all are building is as you see right behind him virtual ai that can answer a lot of the questions for you that can take in the data and translate that data and get it to a healthcare official that may not need to take time out of his day to talk to you personally but can take time out and look through a lot of patients' data really quickly and go, okay, this person says this and that. Okay, well, this seems to sound serious. Let's escalate this. Oh, no, this is, I got a pain in my shoulder or a pain in my elbow. Eh, it's not as critical right now. We can, you know, get to that when we can. So I think that's what the metaverse is going to help. Great. Yeah. Well, that's good. Good to know. And, you know, we, we have care in the, the metaverse, right? Um, we also need payment reimbursement strategies. Um, Jonathan, from a, a, a operation administrative, you know, background, he asked the question: 
you know, how will the metaverse provide reimbursement guidance and strategies? You know, how will like insurance providers address um, a lot of, you know, the cases that they see or, or obtain reimbursement? Um, is that something you see working with, you know, blockchain or, you know, um, digital assets and, and currencies? Yeah, so you, you see the, the, uh, the topic of blockchain, um, of course, every, we use a blockchain, right? Because it's an essential part of the metaverse. But as every technology that we use, it might be a car, it might be a credit card, it might be a blockchain. It's not something that you want people to collide with. When you drive a car, you don't think about the engine or how the navigation system runs. You just drive the car. And when you use your credit card, you don't think about how is that encryption mechanism working with the bank. Right? You just pay, you just swipe the card and then you're good to go. Same with the blockchain technology. So the blockchain technology is there, but people should not be confronted with MetaMask or with all these tools and with private keys because most of the people will say, oh no, I'm afraid of that. It's maybe dangerous, I'm, I'm, I cannot handle it and you lose them. So I think the strategy is to keep these technologies there, but invisible in the background to, to, to make people use them and to help people, but not to, to make them collide with it. And when we speak about reimbursement strategies about insurance company, as Arabian said, it's again, the real world application. Insurance companies will see, will say, okay, this and this and this um, service we will pay for consultation, a therapy, a, a speech, maybe an appointment. So that's, or, or VR rehabilitation. So they will define, we will define together with the, with the, with the payers, with the insurance companies, what services can be provided for a patient that can be paid by the insurance company. And there you will find the way for reimbursing the, the, the services. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. And that's the key is it's no different. And we still got to get, it's no different. It's just a, what's the word I can actually use? It's a skin. So a lot of people understand what a, a digital skin is, right? Like you put a skin on top of something, but it still functions in the real world underneath. And that's all that the metaverse is, is an interactive skin on top of healthcare. And most of the things that you do online, I think one of the first things that health, that um, the metaverse in the health space is gonna really, really tackle is mental health. Because mental health, you really don't always have to be in person to talk to somebody, you know, especially when you're dealing with the teams that have been cooped up for two, three years, a lot of mental health things have gone on with that. They just need somebody to talk to, whether virtual or in person or whatever. So I think when it comes to mental health, this is going to be a lifesaver and a game changer, you know, in that regard, for sure. Nice. So we don't have any other questions. We're coming up on time, but I, I would like to leave it with our panelists, um, Arabian, Michael, like, what would you like to see in the next 18 months and in the next three years, as we look to, you know, build out, you know, these healthcare metaverses, you know, what policies initiative, what policies initiative um, should we be looking forward to as, as we move towards adoption? Hey, Raven, you want to start? Oh, okay, I can start. Yeah, I was so used to you starting. Yeah, so I would say we are moving into an interactive world. Like, you know, when I remember, because I'm old, I admit it, you know, when before I always tell people that the younger generation has it so well, because I was from the before time when there was no internet, right? And I remember Web1, you know, it was dial in, like you literally had a modem for those who don't know what a modem is. You took your phone, your home phone, for those who don't know what a home phone is, <laughs> you know, a connected phone. And you would take the phone and you would put it or connect it to a modem and you would dial into the internet. And it was just very static. You would dial in, read some news, maybe leave a message, and then you would disconnect. Web two, interactivity, you know, full operability. You just, you're always connected. Web three, same thing, but more like he said, 3D virtual space, whether it's VR, which is, you know, a smaller percent of the population right now, which will grow as we get more into it, but just moving through a virtual space, whether it's game-like, 
or whether it's just click to click. You know, it could be an elderly person who's never played a video game who doesn't care about that should be able to just, I need to speak to a doctor at my hospital. Okay, you go in, you log in, click on your hospital, you're in your lobby. Click on, you know, what you want to do and what you want to see. And next thing you know, you're in front of a real person or you're in front of a digital AI who looks like a real person who's speaking to you and taking all your information. And I think that's where we're going to go with this. You know, and what, what's very important for us too is we have to prove that this is real good medicine, that we improve people's lives, that we make things easier, that we lower the costs. I mean, let's speak about the costs. In the United States, I read that number one reason for private bankruptcy are debts with hospitals and with, with healthcare providers. And we want to, to solve people's problems. We want to prove that this really improves people's lives. You know, we, we, we made a, the first trial with cardiologic patients with a university hospital in Switzerland. And we will present this on the European Cardiology Congress in August now in Barcelona, where we prove that the metaverse really serves patients, that you can do real medicine. That's what we have to prove. And that's what I want to see in the next year, one to two years. We have to prove that what we do improves the system and not maybe completely, but starts healing the healthcare systems. I mean, COVID has proven that the healthcare systems do not work like they should. I think it's it's anywhere the same. And I hope that we can improve the situation that people say, oh my God, this really makes my life easier. That saves my money, that saves my time, or it saves my life. That's that's what I want. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I know we had one request from the audience. There's a new initiative. Um, I believe one of our attendees would like to announce. So I will have her announce that. And if there are any other questions, you know, feel free to email us. You know, we'll be able to put you in touch um, with their respective panelists. But thank you guys for um, attending today's talk. And I believe that is April, you can go ahead. Yes, can everyone hear me? Great. So thank you so much, Krista, for uh, hosting this and to the guests as well. I am the Global DNI um, Global Advisor for the XR Safety Initiative, XRSI, and I'll type this in the uh, chat. But we have just launched what we call the Metaverse Reality Check which is a meta oversight consortium of sorts. Um, it's for the people, by the people that are joining, interested on the fringe of what the metaverse could and should be. Um, so we're proud to, uh, uh, um, I'm proud to mention that here for those that are interested on where their role is going to be in the intersection of healthcare and, met and the metaverse. So thank you, Krista. And I will type the information in the chat. Thank you, April, and congratulations on that launch. We look forward to seeing more, you know, come out of that initiative and alliance. Okay, any last words from anyone? Uh, All right. I do, no, let's let's do what uh, we thought what we said. I would like to see people type into the chat what they think the metaverse is, just in one little short sentence or something like that. What is the metaverse to you? <laughs> We'll give everyone a couple couple seconds, couple seconds to type that in. Yeah. But see, someone said <laughs> oh, <right. snow> crash. <laughs> the OG metaverse. The OG metaverse. <laughs> but you know, my point being is that you're gonna get 75 different answers, yeah. you know, to what it is. And what I tell people, they're all right, because the metaverse is everything and will be everything. Nice. OK. So you have more of that, that, that foretelling sci-fi. Yeah. Um, but agreed. No, I believe, you know, with the technologies that we're seeing emerge now, you know, with the metaverse, we're entering into a new age, not only of the internet, but, you know, we're going to be able to, you know, improve in and have greater capacity, not only to conduct business, um, but to offer services that, you know, we've never seen before, um, especially in a, a virtual um, world. So, you know, I look forward to what you both have built um, 
and 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 you know gain in that adoption as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Talisha. Thank you, everyone.